Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be back at Kai. I, I came to Kai, I think the first time, maybe six, seven years ago, and I saw a talk on crowdsourcing by Michael Bernstein that blew my mind and really altered the trajectory of my research from then on. Um, so I'm happy to be talking here again, and I think in that spirit I'll talk a lot about social computing and crowds. And I'm gonna start with a, uh, some trends that many of you in the room are probably familiar with, uh, more and more people are spending time on social applications and platforms when they go on their online phone, uh, go on their phones or go online. This is especially true for the team demographic, which is migrating away from native mobile apps to social messaging platforms. And uh, not a day goes by, in fact, this actually happened this morning, we see some kind of statistic showing how much time we spend on social media, uh, Facebook, for example, or, or other social platforms. So on the one hand, we can look at this data and these trends and sort of pull our hair out and bemoan the fact that companies like Facebook can engineer such perversely addictive systems. Um, or we could look at this data and, and see it more as a reflection of the fact that our brains are wired to connect, that we're inherently social beings, social creatures, and that just as Facebook will exploit these drives, um, we can leverage them as well to help augment our uh, interventions for mental health and well-being. Uh, social neuroscientist Matthew Lieberman has articulated this and he writes that we need to figure out how to engage the social brain as part of the learning process. We need the social brain to work for us, not against us. And so today I'm going to argue that socially mediated interventions, interventions we build for mental health, well-being that have social components interwoven within them, can unlock some really profound and interesting opportunities for engaging the users and also uh, therapeutic efficacy. To make this argument, I'm gonna use COCO as a case study. This is where I work all the time now. Um, it started as a web-based platform that I developed at MIT, which it started as essentially as a crowdsourced implementation of online cognitive therapy. Uh, it has since evolved to a mobile app. We, we released a mobile application early in 2016. And even uh, more recently, we have integrated this into messenger platforms like Facebook Messenger, Telegram, and Kik. Um, and this has been a really interesting um, new development for us. I'd, I'd love to talk more about conversational agents. I, I agree with Mary that there's some incredible opportunities here and it would be very, I think, hard for us to go back to native mobile applications now that we've sort of dipped our toes in this space. The development process is so rapid. Um, we're getting probably 95% of our traffic from these sources. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting space. But that's so new, I'm gonna mostly show you screenshots of the app, but the app is, is pretty similar. So, so what does this app do? Well, it's, it's designed to resemble social platforms. So like most social platforms we're familiar with, you can post content to a network. You can compose responses. On this particular app, responses aren't limited to trained clinicians, coaches, or therapists. Anyone who posts can also be a respondent. So on the surface, uh, it's designed to resemble discussion forums and social platforms we're all very familiar with. But there's an incredible amount of nuance and structure embedded within the app that we've refined over the years to ensure that the interactions that transpire between individuals on this network align with and reinforce some evidence-based principles. So this is just a quick snapshot of a post that was submitted to our network. Uh, so the app will guide people to compose descriptions of situations that are stressing them out and negative thoughts they're having. And this uh, particular post uh, is actually related to, let's see, it looks like this was a, a father struggling with thoughts of having a kid. Um, and so when we're kind of beset with stressful situations and we may not have family, friends, or therapists to divulge our feelings to, maybe it's two in the morning, a lot of us will sort of perseverate on one negative interpretation, even though for any given situation, there are potentially millions of ways to construe it and think about it. Um, but we often find ourselves very stressed out and our brain's ability to think flexibly and creatively and with poise is often systematically impaired in those moments. 
And that's especially true if you're dealing with depression or anxiety. And so a lot of us will just sort of chew on these thoughts very unproductively and ruminate on them. Well, the app gives you uh, a strong motivation to write it down in the first place. You're going to get some interesting social feedback. Um, so writing your negative thoughts down and contextualizing them can sometimes give you distance from them and can be some, somewhat therapeutic in itself. What's also interesting is you can then uh, transfer these thoughts and almost sort of transfer the burden off to this social network um, when you submit and you post it. And a lot of our users um, will state anecdotally, at least, that when they press post, they often feel a pretty immediate reduction in anxiety symptoms um, because they feel like the problem has been transferred to this crowd and it's now their purview to work on it. So, so what does this crowd do for people on this app? Um, so we have other individuals on the app. Um, these, uh, again, are the same people who post. Um, and they do something what we call a reframe or a cognitive reappraisal. And I'm not going to go into all the details about how we instruct them to do this or you know, what precisely we're asking them to do. But the basic idea is that we're trying to leverage the wisdom of crowds to help people think more flexibly and realistically about stressful situations. We're trying to use this crowd to help people find hope and optimism in places they never thought to look. And so you can get uh, replies back like this. These are some replies that came back, reframes that came back to this particular uh, post that was submitted to the network. Uh, on the messaging app, this can happen very, very quickly. Our median response time is somewhere around eight uh, minutes, six minutes, and that includes all sorts of moderation we perform, both human and automated. And you can often get four to five or even 10 or 20 types of responses for these things. So if the goal of a, an app like this is, is simply to help people start to think more flexibly about um, stressful situations and maybe introduce people to some basic tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, why bother with all this social stuff? Um, it's really hard um, to build a social app at scale. Um, many of you in this room I haven't seen in a year or two since I've been working on this, and you might notice I have a lot of gray hair now. Um, so when you're building a social system, you have to worry about moderation at scale, you have to worry about safety, user privacy. Um, it's incredibly difficult. So why not just build a self-guided app or a coach-supported app um, to teach some of these skills. Um, and I think one reason is that when you embed a lot of social dynamics and social interactions, um, as Mary mentioned, it can drive up user engagement, but it can, it can also unlock some really interesting opportunities to possibly augment the therapeutic value of what you're building. And one aspect of this, I'm not going to go through um, all sorts of different examples. I'm just going to kind of cherry pick some that are of interest to me lately. Um, one is this idea of peer-based learning that can be unlocked when you're teaching your users through a very social, interactive, reciprocal dynamic. So when I was first uh, contemplating this um, app, it was at MIT, I was very stressed and I had kind of just a selfish need for this. I was just building it for myself. And I really had this a model where I would just kind of press a button and this crowd would come to my aid. And I had this like really ugly complex ballet of crowd work that I would set into motion. And I assumed that no stranger in their right mind at two in the morning would willingly untangle my negative thoughts for free. Um, so I decided to pay mechanical Turk workers to, to do this for me. So I had these mechanical work, Turk workers doing this um, but pretty quickly, I started to get some feedback from the Turk workers. And, and at this point, I had done dozens of mechanical Turk tasks. I'm kind of a mechanical Turk hobbyist person. I like to do all sorts of weird things on mechanical Turk. But I started to see feedback that I'd never seen before, one of which was, I might do this for free. I've never since heard a mechanical Turk worker say that. Um, I have. Uh, some, some of the workers were talking about how it was sort of helpful to learn these techniques. I'd give them a mini tutorial, then they'd go practice it and, and perform it. So that was really interesting, and when we launched, we decided to just go out on a limb and say, all right, let's, let's really reduce the burden of Mechanical Turk. When the app launched, we had no Mechanical Turk workers. And so 
There was a big question. Uh, are people going to be posting in droves to an echo chamber of no one responding? And what's going to happen? Um, but in just a few months, we've collected over 100,000 responses from people from over 155 different countries. Um, people are highly motivated to do this. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from our users. They send us email or in-app messages. A lot of people send us snail mail, which is a little strange. Um, and we've recorded and logged uh, hundreds of these on our Tumblr site. And a lot of the interesting uh, qualitative feedback we see is from people who state that the benefit they see from the app is not from consuming help from the crowd. The like prime like primary use case of you know press a button and get some crowdsourced emotion regulatory feedback doesn't resonate quite as much as when people experience composing reframes or learning the skill by teaching it to others. And I think there there are probably many hypothetical reasons why this could be valuable. Um, positive psychologists will say that small acts of kindness performed under the right circumstances can boost positive mood. Um, a lot of our users talk about the sheer repetition this opens up to them. So if you're doing thought records and CBT for yourself, you might do a couple during the week, maybe work through some um, with your therapist once a week. But we see a lot of users sync 30, 40 minutes at a time on this app doing reframe after reframe after reframe. And a lot of them then start to feel it as an automatic behavior that they then perceive themselves doing it for themselves. Um, but I think there's a tremendous amount of power that can come when you're teaching other people. I think learning by teaching others is an, an incredible way to um, build some of these systems. And ultimately, a lot of the systems we're building are educational tools. We want to teach people how to adopt new behaviors of, of thinking and, and managing their mood uh, that might not come naturally. Um, so some colleagues of ours at Columbia have looked at our data and independently, without looking at this anecdotal feedback, they did observe a significant relationship showing that the people on the app that help others the most showed the most significant reductions in depression symptoms. So in addition to um, the kind of therapeutic benefits that might get unlocked when you have individuals working together and teaching each other, um, another thing I should mention is a lot of our users uh, report profound sense of self-efficacy. They've tried and failed to regulate their thoughts and feelings, but then they do it for another person. That person writes them a thank you note, and they then feel empowered to do it for themselves. The other thing that's really uh, amazing about um, interweaving, interweaving social elements into your apps is it unlocks these engagement mechanisms. Um, so we can all probably think of reasons why Facebook is engaging, and there's some pretty obvious ones. I want to talk about some, some of the less obvious reasons why social elements can be really powerful. And you know, if you don't have an engaging app, no matter how rigorous your intervention is, if no one's using it, uh, it's of little use. Um, so one of the things that's you know, pretty powerful is, is social proof. So if you're trying to get your users to perform a behavior that might be challenging at first or unnatural, and you don't have an ability to build a therapeutic alliance or do motivational interviewing, one thing that I found that seems to work pretty well is just dropping them into an app and showing them immediately examples of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of their peers performing these behaviors. They tend to just follow suit pretty gracefully. Another thing that is uh, pretty important is when you have a social system and you can show people examples of others performing these activities, you can afford to rely a little less on explicit written psychoeducation instructions. Um, in my experience with this app, at least, I found that people generally aren't as responsive to explicit instruction as they are to implicit um, signals. Um, and the amazing thing about a social app is when the users open it, it's sort of like walking into a room and you don't know anyone. The way you learn and perform is to mimic and model behaviors of other people. And so when you're at scale, you can start to programmatically and preferentially lift up positive exemplars of the behaviors you want to see people performing, and almost like magic, people just sort of start to mimic it. Meaningful triggers. These are really important as well. If you guys are familiar with uh, persuasive system design, I think that's come up at Kai quite a bit. 
Um, in the startup culture, we have almost the exact same thing called the hook, hook canvas. Um, this is the idea when we, we're building apps for behavior change or habit formation, and we want to expose people repeatedly to an intervention to get the requisite dose. Triggers are really important. You need a reason for people to be pinged to come back to the app. Um, and this, in some cases, people argue is as important as just their motivation to do so. Um, I download a lot of apps in this space, a lot of apps in this space, and I get so many push notifications from these apps all the time. I've probably gotten several while I'm standing here. For the most part, they're pretty, they're not too compelling. Um, they'll be, hey, go fill out your mood diary, or um, how are you doing? And I don't even know who's asking me that question. It's just sort of an app. Um, so often it sort of feels like a chore to our users. So. One of the things that's, things that's great about social, socially mediated interventions is people are interesting, and they do all sorts of interesting things, and you can take the exhaust of these social interactions and use them in your push notifications. So even if you aren't bringing people back explicitly to do an activity that you want them to, some of the social exhaust that happens is enough to bring them to the app to begin with, and from there you may have a foot in the door to actually get them to do some more, some more work. A couple other items, um, when you have a social system, communities can form. So our, our network is totally anonymous, and yet people start to form communities. They can form uh, communities at the, the app-wide level, and uh, you can start to leverage, leverage this to enhance motivation of the users. Um, this is something you see offline in peer movements like AA or the peer recovery movement, where people start to form an attachment and a bond to the group as a whole. And so if their own sort of personal motivation starts to wane, the, the attachment and commitment to the group as a whole may carry them through. Um, you can kind of stoke this a little bit and create sort of tribalism within your crowd. We've done this on the forum that is in the app, that's a forum about the app, um, where users will debate what they want to call themselves and, and really start to feel this in-group that they're committed to. We could probably do a lot better job of that. Um, the other thing uh, is when you have social interactions, people can naturally form bonds with each other. And we see this happening even when users have these pseudo-anonymous names. They don't know how old, what gender, or anything really about the user. They may know roughly what country they're from. Um, and if users have interacted um, frequently, you can by design make that happen. So you can by design kind of couple people naturally and then if a user's motivation starts to wane, you can use that to um, bring them back to the app. So one thing we found that works really well is if a user has helped you three or four times, you can send a push notification saying, hey, this person um, might need a reframe, they've helped you four times. So the reciprocity rule is, is pretty powerful um, and you can unlock that in social systems. And finally, uh, you can start to appeal to ideals, even beyond the, the group of the app or your, your society or your community. You can start to get users to think about building something that's greater than themselves. So again, when a motivation to, to work on the app or whatever intervention you're doing wanes, and it will wane, um, you can start to you know, show them examples of how their work is being built to create something bigger than themselves. And that can be an extremely powerful tool as well. And speaking of expanding the community, we are expanding ourselves and we're looking for good machine learning people um, that want to help others. So if that you know, speaks to you, please contact us. We also have uh, research collaborations um, that are ongoing and we would like to expand some of those um, because I really value the cross-pollination that can happen at events like this. Um, I think startups have a, a lot to learn, but a lot to offer as well. Um, so any bi-directional communication could be great for all parties. So thank you guys. Um, thanks for listening.